We are in Champions League, man. That was my Dilly din, dilly dong, come on. Ancara Messi, 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 Hello, welcome to the Modern Soccer Coach Podcast. My name is Gary Kernin. This is number eight in our series of culture podcasts with World Strides Excel. So World Strides are the industry leader in international soccer tours with over 15 years of experience delivering tours to coaches and teams. Very, very simple. You pick the country, our countries, and their experts will customize a trip that will include competitive matches, training sessions, tickets to the big games, and some sightseeing as well. They also offer a high level of quality support and service, including financial assistance, liability coverage, flights, and hassle-free travel. So in addition to the Culture Podcasts, we are also teaming up with World Strides to bring the first ever Modern Soccer Coach Education Tour in Barcelona on February 6th to the 12th. So really excited about that. We'll have a clinic with the Catalan Football Federation, full day club visits to youth academies in the area. We'll be connecting with some leading coach education experts and of course take in a game at the new camp as well. So really excited about teaming up with World Strides on this and also experiencing Spanish culture with a group of coaches. So information coming on that there soon and how to sign up and all that good stuff. So on the subject of Barcelona, we have Damien Hughes joining us for this podcast. Damien is a professor of organizational psychology and change. He's an international speaker, consultant and author. He's written three books, Five Steps to Winning Mindset, How to Think Like Sir Alex Ferguson, and his new book is The Barcelona Way, Unlocking the DNA of Winning Culture. So I absolutely love his books, brilliant insight, written like no other, funny, loads of exercises to work with in your team and then yourself personally, all about that mindset and how to improve it. So in this podcast, we talk about Sir Alex Ferguson and the role of leadership in cultures, uh, the role of humor, the role of fear, how to change culture as a leader, how to improve culture as a leader. And then also the, we, we talk about the Barcelona culture, what makes it special, how is that shaped from the top, and then how is that sustained over a long period of time. So you're going to love this as coaches. Plenty of stuff that you can work through with your teams and then insight on how you can improve personally as well. So love to hear your thoughts on this as always. Please, please, please let me know at Gary Kernin on Twitter, at Gary Kernin on Instagram. Gary at modernsoccercoach.com and also if you wouldn't mind giving it a rating on the iTunes page help us spread the word of the podcast really appreciate you listening here's Damien enjoy Damien thanks for joining me today for the Modern Soccer Coach podcast excited to have you on oh it's a real pleasure to be on it Gary it's, I've, uh, I've been a follower for a long time and uh, I'm really excited to chat with you so I've read I've read two of you about Liquid Thinker and the Sir Alex Ferguson book the obvious question I have for you on the on the Sir Alex book, yeah. why why him? Is it because you were a United fan, or or did his state of leadership intrigue you um, from from your role in the psychology aspect? A um, couple of reasons. One, I mean, I am a Manchester United fan. I'm a Manchester lad, so uh, so um, a lot of my uh, life has been spent up watching Alex Ferguson's teams. But the other reason was he's just a guy that's defied the odds in every way. So like. The average tenure of a football manager is 14 months for 26 years. What we know is that as a, um, a manager that gets sacked in that period, it's something like 70% of them will never find a job working in uh, football again as a head coach. So what intrigued me about Ferguson is it's an industry where the failure rate is high, the consequences are huge, and yet Ferguson was somehow able to build three great teams and sustain it over and over again. So... It has to be something around management and his coaching style. And that was very much what intrigued me to want to go and pursue that in more detail. How difficult did you find the research when you were conducting it in terms of, you, know, you spoke to a few players, were they open 
when they were discussing him or were they a bit wary of, of questions in regards to their manager because of the respect they had for him? Well, that last term you used, Gary, about respect is, is the one that came through all of it. I'd say there's two words that define Ferguson when I was doing the research, respect and uh, just an essential decency. People spoke about him as just what a, what a fantastic man he was. And then secondly, they spoke about him as being a fantastic coach. So he was very much around personal players that told me that years since I'd seen him and yet he'd still remember the wife and the children's name and he'd inquire after them and things like that. So I think people were initially a little bit reluctant because they wanted to make sure that the book wasn't being seen as trying to dig for any dirt or do a hatchet job on him when they understood that it was very much around, it was almost a love letter to Ferguson of understanding very much the psychology of how he sustained success for so long. People then were a lot more generous with time and their insights and their anecdotes around him. Did you manage to get a copy to him? Yeah, I did. So what happened was um, there was some context around it. So when he announced his retirement, he uh, he brought out his own autobiography. And I, I was doing the research for this book at the same time. So um, I um, there was even some discussions that he might be interested in getting involved with me with it. But then he had issues with his own publishers that meant that wasn't possible. But um, I sent him a copy and um, I got word back from, we have uh, mutual friends in common, and he said that he thoroughly enjoyed it. You, you mentioned earlier about, like, he, he kind of defied the odds, and by staying at United for so long, and now we say, like, there's going to be, a lot of coaches in the community are now saying, there's not going to be anyone like Sir Alex or nobody like Arsene Wenger. Um, yeah. do, you think, do you think sometimes in that attitude that we take the easy way out, by almost placing limits in ourselves that we can't stay anywhere and sustain success like that. Yeah, exactly. Because if you look at it, that, that, that we're, you'd have said that there'd never been another Herbert Chapman at Arsenal or that there'd never been another Matt Busby or you look at Shankly and Paisley comes along. So I think the very fact that, that, we, that we have people out there that don't listen to that convention, that are prepared to do something and, 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 and challenge those expectations. And Ferguson was a brilliant example of that. You know, this was a guy that went, uh, that he was belligerent in the extreme when he went to Aberdeen and you read some of the stories around him there. But then, and this was the theme of the book that came across. He was a man that just embraced change in every aspect. So I often quote a start around, if you look at Ferguson during the first 21 years of his reign at United, he had seven different assistant coaches. In contrast, Wenger had one, which was Pat Rice. Now, that's not a criticism of Wenger, but the point is it gives you an illustration of why Ferguson sustained success for so long that he was prepared to bring in people to challenge his own thinking, to bring in people that had a set that complemented his own rather than see it as a threat. He embraced the change of having people come in. So he had Archie Knox when he first came to Manchester United that he brought with him from Aberdeen. And Archie Knox had a reputation as being a strict and quite a fierce disciplinarian in so they came in and established some of the some of the rules. And then he brought in Brian Kidd that coincided with the emergence of the class of ninety two guys. So he, Kidd was somebody that had grown up with these um, uh, that these players had grown up with. So we had a way of being able to connect and nurture them. Then when Kidd left, he brought in Steve McLaren. Now McLaren was seen as being technically a fantastically innovative coach, and yet his players at that stage were technically adept. So they needed someone to come in and challenge them. Then he brought in Carlos Quieres, somebody again that was prepared to bring in a more European outlook. So just giving you those quick four examples, show you how Ferguson um, had the ability to adapt and embrace change, which is what kept him at the forefront. And I see no reason why there won't be another Ferguson, somebody that can learn off his lessons. You know, one of my key phrases I often use when I work with teams, Gary, is I often say, success leaves clues. And if we look, and that's part of the idea of the book, that if we look at the clues that Ferguson's success has left us, there's some of it that we can adopt in, in our own world, regardless of um, where we work in our coaching. In the book, you write about the insight from Gary Neville. I love this, his favourite team talk that Ferguson did three or four times. Look around the dressing room, look at the others, and be proud of this group together. By the time he's finished, you can feel the back, the hairs on the back of your neck standing to attention. What more motivation do you need? Um, that intrigues me because 
My question, I suppose, is that a youth coach who uses the same speech two or three times is probably met with eye roll or here he goes again, disengagement. Yeah. How does Sir Alex Ferguson make the same speeches and get inspiration from players? I think there's a couple of answers to that, Gary. I mean, I think the first one of what Ferguson was actually doing there um, in terms of encouraging the players to look around at their teammates is he was tapping into a very basic idea that all successful teams, all successful cultures have, which is change needs to be driven from the dressing room, not from the head coach. So, so I use the phrase cultural architects. So when I go and work with the team, I want to know who are the cultural architects? Who are the guys that run that dressing room for you? Now, they will be there within any dressing room. Bad dressing rooms, the cultural architects tend to be more dysfunctional characters. Good dressing rooms have got good people running them. So these are the guys that, if you think of someone like Carles Puyol at Barcelona, there's some brilliant examples of him that this Barcelona are beating Real Numancia 5-0. And two of the players, Thiago and Alva, start doing this elaborate samba dance. And Puyol runs over and stops them doing it again, comes out and issues an apology to the opposition. Because he says, that's not what we do at this club. We want to beat you, but we don't want to humiliate you. Mm. Now, that message is far more powerful coming from one of your colleagues in the dressing room than it is coming from the head coach because they would say, oh, he's out of touch. He doesn't understand us. So what Ferguson was doing on that occasion was about saying, look around the dressing room and you don't let each other down because he knew that he had strong characters in there that would hold each other to account if they were doing that. So... I think you can get away with that message when it's consistent with the culture and you understand why you're doing it. I think the danger that you highlight, and this is one that a lot, I, I say this with a lot of coaches, they go for gimmicks sometimes. So it might be uh, like a gimmick of a theme or it might be a gimmick of bringing somebody in from the outside to try and stimulate them. But if you understand the messages of what your culture is based on and what is the team, you can get away with repeating some of these messages because they recognise that there's no gimmickry in it. it. You're just merely stating the truth to them. You know, so he would have different ways of, of, of highlighting that. So sometimes Ferguson would talk about the idea that he looked to seek inspiration himself from outside of football. So he would bring in, uh, so he'd go and watch an opera and come in and talk to the players about the way that it's in an opera work together or an orchestra working together or we'd sometimes bring in things about um, looking at the pattern of birds flying but although he was using different messages it, the theme which was sticking together not letting your teammates down was entirely consistent and I think that can often be helpful for coaches that as long as you're clear about the uh, the key themes or what I sometimes call the trademark behaviours you can find innovative ways of, of talking about them, but at the same time repeating and re-emphasising the core point that you want your players to understand. Manchester United never get beat. We occasionally run out of time, but we never get beat. Is such a powerful use of language. I just love that there. Well, how does how does a coach become more aware of how they're framing situations? Because a different coach could just frame it as in like. Don't don't lose today. We can't afford to lose today. Same message, yeah. the way of saying it. It's a brilliant question, Gary. And what I often say, I mean, my real interest is working with coaches because I think coaches are the ones that carry the real power in terms of shaping a culture. And so I often talk to coaches and say, you only have three expectations. So if you think about a game, you only have your brain can only focus on one of three possible outcomes. You either expect to win you hope to win or you expect to lose does it and your brain can only focus on one of those three so if you expect to lose what you often see there is nobody comes out and will say that directly but you will often see it betrayed in in the preparation or you will see it betrayed in the fact that you're not giving the same focus or attention to it um i remember working with one coach many years ago that uh, would refer to his players as clowns. And it was like, well, what do you expect to them? The hoping to win is probably 
a brilliant example of what happened when Ferguson left. So if you look at David Moyes' statement when he was in charge of Manchester United, he spoke about, we'll try to make it difficult. We hope to aspire to be a team like City. So even very subtly, his focus was very different, whereas Ferguson's was always on the idea that we expect to win. In any situation, we expect to win. So we will gamble, we will come at you, and we will be relentless in it. So there's a lovely example of, um, I came across a brilliant anecdote from, uh, the, uh, from Robbie Brady, where Robbie Brady was talking about, he'd been at Manchester United since he was 14, and one day he was queuing up in the canteen at Carrington for his lunch, and Cristiano Ronaldo came out, uh, freshly showered, and uh, Robbie Brady allowed him to go in front of him to get his food first. And when he got to the end of the canteen queue, Ferguson was waiting for him. Now, this is a brilliant example of coaching because Ferguson said to Robbie Brady, what did you do that for? And he said, what do you mean? He said, why did you let Cristiano go in front of you? And he said, oh, I was just being polite. And he said, well, it wasn't being polite. He was prepared to queue like you. Why did you let him go in front of you? And after a bit of to and fro in, so Robbie said, it's because he's Cristiano Ronaldo. He's the best player in the world. And Ferguson pulled him up short and said, he said, I want you to believe that you're better than him. Because if that belief doesn't start with you, how can you expect me and the coaches to have the confidence in you to replace him? So he was looking at ways of just reinforcing this idea that belief starts both at an individual level and then it can transmit as a collective level. And the way he articulated it is we never get beat. We'll occasionally run out of time, but we will never get beat. And to give you that sense of they will keep coming at you. I just did a podcast there, Kevin George. He's just released a book on, on psychology and he's All right. yeah, it's, it's very, very good. He, he pinpointed, he talked to Quentin Fortune and he brought up that oh, he yeah. pinpointed the strength of Sir Alex's, how aware he was about how his behaviour impacted others in different ways and that self, and I find that self-awareness piece in working with other coaches and talking to other coaches, that self-awareness piece, piece is critical but for a coach who, who struggles with self-awareness, how can they develop it more or just get it in general? Well, that's a brilliant question. And I, and it goes back a little bit, I'd say, uh, Gary, to that the first thing that we spoke about, about the kind of people that you surround yourself with. Um, so from a coaching point of view, um, who are the people that you take your, that you take your advice from? And this has to be really carefully chosen because – Obviously, at different levels of coaching, you, like everybody's got an opinion and often people have got their own agendas that are coming into it. So I often say part of my role with a coach is to almost be the guy that will challenge their thinking if nobody else is doing it. So the one that will just force them to think through and to analyse it. Now, it's not that I know better than them. It's quite the opposite, but it's just the idea that my agenda isn't driven by the outcome of who gets picked or whether you win on a uh, on an afternoon. It's more that's why I prefer to work with the coaches because I can try and develop that relationship with them. That my interest is in their success, not necessarily in the teams. So there's a brilliant statistic that um, that um, I've just finished a book looking at how Barcelona do this, and this is the interesting thing that Guardiola just to use him. As, um, as an example, he, he had uh, four different mentors that he still that he had operating people that he either regarded as peers of his or people that he looked up to and that he admired. So the obvious one was Cruyff, but he also had uh, Bielsa out in Argentina. Um, he had a guy called uh, Juan Lilo that coached out in Mexico, but a Spanish coach. And then the fourth guy he, he employed was a guy called Manel Estiar who's got nothing to do with football. He's a former water polo world champion. And Guardiola surrounded himself with people like that, that he knew would tell him what he needed to hear rather than what he wanted to hear. So I'd, I'd encourage coaches to find mentors, people that are not invested in the outcome of, of the success of what their teams do, but are invested in the outcome of that coach developing, whether it's a self-awareness or just getting better. In that development then of coaches you mentioned in the in the book that you said earlier in the book I suggested that you start to think like Sir Alex Ferguson 
it's essential when you do you begin to review your own goals more regularly well i got me thinking do you think coaches actually set personal goals or do we just grab the goals of the team and just say that's where we're going as well yeah i think the, the, i see a lot of coaches will often neglect their own development because they become so infused in terms of what the team is about and that's that's the direction where unhappiness lies because there's so much of that that's outside of your control. So I've worked with coaches where I'll often encourage them to get them into the idea of, so look at developing the relationships that you have with these guys. If they're good enough and you've made the judgment that they're good enough to get in your dressing room, develop the relationships with them. I'll give you a good example. Um, I sometimes use, and apologies for the sort of industrial language, but I often use a test with some coaches that came out of a conversation years ago that we call the test. Because I remember working with one coach who said to me about a player, he said, oh, he's a real And my question was, is he a or is he just a for you? And he said, oh, well, how do I know the difference? So I took him through a questionnaire that we developed, we call it the test, where it was just a series of questions like, has he got a partner? What's the name? What's the name of his children? How old are they? Where did he last go on holiday? What car does he drive? What are his interests outside of the of the game? You know, how does he drink his, his tea? And it was all questions like that. And the irony was, there's only generally three patterns that emerge from that question. The one that you often recognise is that you probably don't know a lot about them. Mm -hmm. And then that forces you to look at your own relationship with them and say, well, maybe it's you. Maybe he's actually a really decent guy. Maybe it's just in your company that you start to see some of his worst aspects. So just use that as a quick illustration to say that often for coaches, if you're investing uh, your self-worth or your goals in what the team does, you're putting yourself in a in quite a precarious position that, that, you know, you know as well as I do, there's more downs than there is ups in any sport. So if you're going to follow that path, that's a path where unhappiness and frustration will um, will frequently lie what's your thoughts on fear as a coach as it re relates to motivation and using it because again when we talk about sir alex we think about the hair dryers and the you know getting into that changing room when you're playing bad but talking about the older age groups do you think fear has a place when it comes to motivation sometimes yeah but but sparingly um, I think if there's a ratio for this, um, I often quote um, the work of uh, Lasado, where he talks about the five to one ratio. So, so the idea that if you want to develop strong relationships, it's about ratios rather than just giving the hairdryer. So he talks about the uh, the way of bidding. So he talks about there's three types of. So if I was to ask you a question now, Gary, and say something like, "Can I get you a glass of water?" That is what he des he describes as a bid for your attention. Now, as a response to that, you only have three three categories of response. You could say something like, yes, please, or no, thank you. And that's classed as a towards response. So what you've done is you've listened to what I've said and you've given me a polite response back. The other response is you could just ignore me or you could ask something unrelated. You could say, uh, what time's training tomorrow? And that's classed as an away bid. So you've ignored what I've said and you've gone away to your own agenda. The third response you could do is you could say, what's it got to do with you? What are you asking me for? Do I look like I want a drink of water? And that's classed as an against bid. So what you're doing is you're attacking me in an aggressive or a hostile way. Now, what all the research says is, is that for a relationship to be at a happy, healthy, vibrant level, you need a ratio of five towards bids for every one bid away or against. Because otherwise, we're, um, the primitive part of our brain is triggered in that kind of environment and we naturally go into freeze flight fight so we either become very apathetic and look and go into our shells freeze we either start wishing we were somewhere else and become distracted and lose focus flight or we become aggressive and confrontational fight so what i'd often encourage coaches to do is to say um the one is there because sometimes you do need to call out poor performance if it's a consistent thing so there's no problem in terms of calling it out as long as you then proportionately praise it five times more. So I often say, try and catch people in rather than catch them out. So 
But don't be afraid that sometimes you do need to catch them out. Now, to go back to the Ferguson one, again, speaking to a lot of the players that were fortunate enough to serve under him, like people talk about the hairdryer, but they will also tell you it was a once or twice a season moment. But the reason we remember it is because that's what the press loves to report on because it's far more attractive to run a story about Ferguson kicking a boot or screaming abuse at somebody than it is to talk about um, his inherent decency or the fact that he was he, uh, he was encouraging. So there was a lovely example I was told about when they were playing Blackpool. Uh, I think it was in his last in his last season or his penultimate one. They were getting beat two 0 at half time, and it was a miserable um, Tuesday night on the uh, on the Blackpool coast. And uh, when they came in at half time, um, um, everybody expected Ferguson to give them a rocket. And that was even more supportive when the players came back out five minutes before the start of the second half. And the commentators on the TV said, oh, Ferguson must have blistered the paint off the walls. He must have thrown teacups at them. When I spoke to a number of players that were there, he did nothing like that. He got the players in, calmed them down and said to them, uh, I believe that you're good enough to get yourself out of this situation. You've got enough players to deal with it. How do you intend to address it? And the players told him, we're going to fix this, this and this. And Ferguson said, that's the exact advice that I would give you. Get out there early, warm up and make sure that you're ready to go at them quickly from the start. But that doesn't sell newspapers. That's not newsworthy to tell that story. It's better to believe that he was screaming abuse at people. And what we know is, I often say this when people ask about it, I say, you have to believe one or two conclusions, either Alex Ferguson defied 300,000 years of evolutionary psychology to become the exception, or you have to believe that sometimes our view of him is a little bit mistaken. And that's another reason for wanting to write the book, to give people an idea that, that the public perception is not always the, tr uh, the truth that, uh, that we can understand about him. Your personal writing style, in my opinion, is a unique blend of psychology and sport and history as well. So there's, there seems to be an emphasis on, on storytelling um, yeah. and almost sucking the reader in. Do you think that's a powerful tool that coaches should be developing more? Yeah, well, first of all, thank you, Gary. I appreciate it. Um, I think part of my writing style has been developed because um, I've grown up as the son of a coach. So I grew up in a boxing gym. Uh, so my dad was a uh, was a boxing coach in uh, in the city of Manchester. So from very early age, I grew up sort of in in the corner as well as being in the ring in the corner uh, and listening to uh, his coaching and developing guys. And um, one of the things that I learned was it's about the strength of relationship. So I went and did my studies in terms of um, I was fortunate enough to get a professorship at the University at Manchester Met a few years ago in sort of organizational psychology and change. But I still hark back to the boxing gym days and the lessons I learned there. And every coach I've met has been a great storyteller. And the reason we be great storytellers is because it taps into a concept called the Kolmogorov complexity. Now the Kolmogorov complexity is the name after a Russian psychologist, but what it means is when you tell somebody a story, the brain opens up to receive that story. So you can lay, you can layer a lot of information there that people will remember afterwards as long as it's told within the story format. So from a coaching point of view, if you're trying to get three or four points across to your players and you can give them a story that illustrates how somebody else has done it, however abstract that might be, we know that psychologically players will, will retain that information for a lot longer than they will do if you just give them two or three points on a bullet chart. So I'll give you an example. Uh, I'm, I'd, I'm currently working on the coaching staff for the Scotland Rugby Union team at the moment. And um, I often encourage the coaches there to use stories for them. So earlier this year in the Six Nations, um, I spent quite a lot of time with one of our coaches because he wanted to emphasise the importance of our players uh, defending. So the way that we did it was we spent quite a lot of time doing it. When the players came into the uh, meeting room, he had them sit down. And he went into this story, getting them to imagine that they were in bed and their partner was next to them and the children were asleep next door. And then he said, and it's about three o'clock in the morning, you hear glass break downstairs. 
and you know that somebody's in the house, your wife wakes up and tells you that somebody's burgling your house. And then we stopped it and said to the players, how are you going to respond now? And what was fascinating was the players, like you'd assume that they would become uh, like alpha males and say, oh, I'll run down there and I'll knock out whoever's in the house. But it was interesting the range of responses that they got, which told us they were really engaged with it. Some players did suggest that. Some players said that they would phone the police. Some said that they would barricade themselves in the room as long as their family was safe. And then we got them to, we gave them a choice of weapons. So we got them things like a hammer or got them things like a torch or things like that. And then we asked the players, you know, the police are going to be there in two hours. So you have to defend your family. How are you going to do it? And what the point we got out of this, it's a long-winded way of explaining it was, we got the players to identify that if they were going to defend their family, they would do so with speed, they would do so with real commitment, and they would use an element of surprise. So once we got those three points across, the players understood it because we connected with them at a storytelling level. So when we went into the point about how our defence was going to shape up, those three things of speed, surprise and commitment were what we were, were what we tied everything together with. So storytelling can work in the, like whether you have your own stories or whether it's just you get players to create their own narrative. It's an incredibly effective way of coaching. You mentioned your your boxing background there with your dad. So I wanted to ask you this one. If and there's part of your book as well. It talks about the influence of Gus D'Amato had on Tyson. Yeah. Um, and I remember reading about that when I was younger, and, and it was like, oh, life changing the role of a coach, and then seeing some documentaries on Freddie Roach, the role of a boxing coach can yeah. have huge. How, how do you think when I watch documentaries on Floyd Mayweather, it looks as if he does it by himself? Is, is that just for the media? Do you know any inside there at all? Well, I mean. Th- so the stuff around D'Amato is um, is brilliant. I mean, I'm fascinated by that uh, in terms of what he did because he repeated it to prove it wasn't a fluke. So he he, he took Floyd Mayweather from a th- uh, Floyd Mayweather uh, Floyd Patterson from the 13 year old boy from New York to become an Olympic champion and then the heavyweight champion of the world, and then 30 years later went and repeated the same trick with Tyson uh, bar the Olympic stuff. And um, it was the way that Tyson said he basically, uh, he would train for two hours a day as a boxer and for 20 hours a day as a person. So he was constantly getting into his head and getting him to understand around emotions. So one of the the Martos, my favorite phrase of the Martos is, he said, there are no stupid people, just uninterested ones. So it's your job to find out what their interests are. And once you can tap into that, you can light that spark of of a fire that lies within all of us. So Freddie Roach is, again, um, another coach that does something like that. Um, the Floyd, uh, the Floyd uh, Mayweather one, I suspect that some of it is a media construct because it's all around him being sort of um, um, egotistical and it's all about money and things like that. I think when you scratch beneath the surface of someone like Mayweather, you actually realise this is a guy that's a consummate professional. This is a guy that that still continues to run and work out even when he's not in a fight. You know, you never see him overweight. You never see him sort of um, linked to any sort of illegal substances or drinking too much and things like that. So I suspect that that's just his way of trying to keep some of what he does discreet and secret because he, but I've, I've no doubt that at his level, he's not training himself. He's got, a team of people behind him that are advising and working with him. One of your presentations I watched, it was to the London Leadership Academy. Yeah. Uh, I had to laugh. You challenged parents who put kids' drawings on the fridge. And you claim that that's like, that offsets a, a whole new problem on talent. Um, as coaches, I know the answer is we are obviously, do we get too excited at younger age groups by skill and talent. Yes, often. Yeah. And it can often, and then it can deceive us as to some of the more obvious things about the kids that, uh, that turn up every time, the kids that are punctual, the kids that work hard, the kids that are persistent, all those qualities can often get sidetracked because we see somebody that's fast or fit or strong or got this, 
a ridiculous ability to dribble a ball or something like that. So I often encourage um, coaches, I talk about this idea of trademark behaviours. So the question I say is, you need to be clear about what are the behaviours that, that you want to encourage. And this is a, above and beyond skill. So I interviewed a guy called Chiki Bagiristain, who was the director of football at Barcelona, who's now at Manchester City. And he had a lovely phrase where he said, talent will get you into our dressing room. Your behaviour decides whether we will keep you there or not. And when I asked him about the behaviours at Barcelona, he said, we have three behaviours, humility, hard work, and you put the team above your own self-interest. So his point was, don't come in here um, showing us your wealth or telling us how famous you are or how many followers you have on Instagram. He said, it's about humility, first of all. The second one is, he said, is you've obviously worked hard to get to this level, so continue to work hard. Don't coast on that talent. And the third one was, if there is ever a clash between what's right for you and what's right for the team, choose what's right for the team. And then, so when you view it through that lens, some of those behaviours actually allow you to look at somebody dispassionate from whether they're talented or not. So a great, I'll get like a great example with them was, they brought Zlatan Ibrahimovic for 70 million euros and sold him for 45 million euros 10 months later. And when you read Zlatan's own book, he tells you stories that if you, so if you view it through the lens of those three behaviours, so when um, they give him the keys to a club Audi and they tell him, don't ever drive your fancy sports cars into training. And he says, why not? And he says, because humility is an important uh, aspect of our club drive your club car in. And the first time he gets dropped for a game against Dan Luera, he says, oh, I'm not driving the club car. And he drives a yellow Lamborghini in and he attracts a whole heap of press attention. When they ask him to play a different position for the team, he, took, he goes to Guardiola and says, I'm a Ferrari and you're using me like a Fiat. If you don't want to play me in my best position, don't play me. So when you view somebody as incredibly talented as Latan through the lens of those trademark behaviours, it doesn't matter how talented he is. If he doesn't fit into your culture, he's not right. And what they said is nobody is bigger than the culture that we have. So I think this becomes even more um, important and imperative at a youth level that you might have somebody that's incredibly talented but has an arrogance or isn't a team player or isn't uh, respectful or humble of that talent. Now, that... So that unless you've identified the behaviours that you as a coach want to see, it becomes very difficult to challenge them and we become blinded by the talent. Whereas if we tell people these are the rules of the game of working with me as a coach, you can then make demands and challenge some of those behavioural aspects because people know that that's what you've asked them to do beforehand. Yeah, we, we almost think of communication and coaching communication, clarity on the we think of it as just on the pitch with our with our terminology or our coaching point or delivery, but in reality, the clarity within our environments and our culture matters even more. Oh, a hundred percent. I think there's some brilliant examples of um, that. This book I was telling you I did on Barcelona that comes out this summer. Um, this was one of the things that I that that fascinated me. That I wanted to look at culture. So people talk about culture, culture is important, but what is it and what does it look like? And there's effectively five different types of culture that we can develop as coaches. So when you understand the five different types of culture you can have, you then say, well, which one do you want? So the first one you have is a superstar culture. So this is, if you think of Real Madrid's Galactico policy, bring in the best players, give them the best access to coaches, give them the best facilities, and you just hope that, that all that will come together to, to great effect. And when it does, it's spectacular. But, uh, but equally, when it goes wrong, it's spectacular. The second culture you have is what we call an autocratic culture, where it's like the, my way or the highway. So it's dominated by one charismatic coach that, 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 that rules everything. And I think in some ways, what's interesting is, I think Manchester United fell into that path, uh, to that mistake, in the last few years of Ferguson's reign. And I think it's betrayed by the language Ferguson used. So during the periods of success, Ferguson would say there is nobody bigger than Manchester United. And towards the end, 
if you look at it very subtly, he started to say there is nobody bigger than the manager of Manchester United, which I think when you take him out of it, you've seen the vacuum of leadership in terms of the culture afterwards. The third way is what we call a, a, bureau, a bureaucratic culture. And this is where you get a lot of middle managers and it's like management by committee. The fourth way is an engineering culture. And this is where you just bring in really skilled individual players and hope that they like technically they add up. So if you think of like Wenger's Arsenal, it's probably a good example of an engineering culture, very technically adept players that you bring together and hope that everybody does their job individually. But the most successful culture is what they call a commitment culture. And a commitment culture is where you're really clear about your purpose and your behaviours. And, and you almost have the view that those behaviours will outlast any individual that's part of that culture. Now, this is where Barcelona went down that route to say, we're going to really focus on this commitment culture where we have these three behaviours of hard work, humility and, um, and uh, team first. And we have this idea that we will play football in the right way to represent Catalonia to the rest of the world. And that was what they were driven by, which was allowed them to make some really clear decisions about who they decided to retain and who they decided to omit from their roster during that success. Just asking you then on, on cultures and the, the Ibrahimovic and the Pep, do you think that... I, I sometimes think that psychology or, or psychologists uh, are reluctant for coaches to almost rip the cord. There obviously is a point, right, where you have to say to the player, listen, this is not working, all the best. Yeah, but, yes, very much. Um, so a large part of the nature of the, of, of the way that I like to work, Gary, is I, I like to work with the coaches uh, because they're the guys that carry real credibility with the play, uh, so with the players. So, say for example, if I went in and spoke to a group of players, naturally there will be some that buy into it, some that are ambivalent about it, and some that are naturally reluctant to engage at any level. But when a head coach stands up and says the same messages that I would do, the players will buy into it because this is the guy that picks the team and they want to be a part of it for the week after. So they will at least give it a go. So my interest is, I often say, take the ego out of it and work with the coaches, work with the guy, because your ideas can get into the bloodstream of the culture a lot faster. And then, but then this is where I, so when I work with the coaches, I often start at that behavioral level and say, have you been clear about the rules of the game? Because it becomes very difficult to pull up a player for what you regard as dysfunctional behaviors if you haven't clarified the rules of the game in advance. So take the Zlatan thing. The reason that they got rid of him after 10 months was because they it, because they told him from day one, this is the way that we do things here. The players have done it. Players have tried to help him to assimilate to the organisation. And they just got lots of examples of his dysfunctional behaviour that just didn't fit the culture that they wanted. So they felt that they'd been clear enough, they'd give him enough chances and they had to get rid of him. You know, but you look at somebody like Samuel Leto. Part of the reason, so when Guardiola came in, he made the announcement that Eto, Deco, and Ronaldinho would, would have no part to play in his team. And yet he went back and changed his mind on Eto for a season. And part of the reason for that is because he talks about his work rate in training when he came back after that announcement was higher than everybody else's. And Puyol and Iniesta and, um, and Xavi went to Guardiola as a representative and said, we think you should give this guy another go. We're seeing evidence that he is buying into these behaviours. So from a coaching point of view, you have to be clear about the rules of the game, the behaviours that are non-negotiable. And once you're clear about them, making decisions as to whether a player... I talk about the FIFO effect kicks in. You give a player a choice then, they can either fit in or f*** off, but you give them that choice. But you have to be clear, as a coach, you have to be clear about the behaviours that you expect. My last question for you. Humour in your in your writing and in your tweets as well. Um, I <laughs> laughed a lot when I, when I read your books. And I think then about how powerful that is in your message. And then I think back to where up until I was 16, if I, if I had to describe the coaches I had, um, within three words would be funny 
And then I think that if I go after a 15, when I start coaching myself, if I had to describe any coach I've worked with, or I had to guess how players would describe me, Tony wouldn't be in the top 20 comments. <laughs> and, and I think I'm a decently humoured guy. So are we now moving towards, is funny humour, Is it? are we getting it wrong? Should we bring a bit more in, humour into our coaching is what I'm asking you. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I've got, <laughs> I mean, like this, now this might put the cat amongst the pigeons, what I say. I think there is a difference with humour that, uh, I often say I've yet to meet anybody that uses the word banter that isn't a bit of a d- <laughs> and, and, and what I mean by that is I mean the kind of cruel banter that you'll yeah. often see in dressing rooms where where it's being nasty and it's snide and it's underhand and, and rather than give somebody direct feedback, you try and take the mickey out of them and hope that they might pick up the message. That's the kind of humour that is hugely, hugely destructive in a dressing room and yet it can often go unchecked because people will go oh it's banter and i say no no it's a dangerous thing to allow that to take hold when uh, 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 in any culture but humor where it's about where it's inclusive becomes a really powerful tool because if you're prepared to demonstrate humor it does two things one it shows a human side to you but secondly it shows a vulnerability that you're prepared to laugh and show that you don't take yourself too seriously so they know that you're human but there's something vulnerable about being prepared to laugh whether it, or to make a joke because you have to expose a little bit of yourself. And yet, go back to your point, Gary, around the, uh, the coaches that you had when you described them as fun. They were people that you obviously engage with at a deep human level rather than just a transactional uh, level in terms of they were a coach and they told me what to do. They were people that you would follow, you'd engage and you'd listen to. So I think the right kind of humour is really important. Um, you know, when people are laughing, you can slip an idea in and they don't even realise. So I think introducing that element of fun, like we know that when people are laughing as well, they will naturally create the dots. So creativity becomes a, a, a almost like a byproduct of, of, of humour in any environment. That shows that people can join the dots and, th- and see see things outside of their normal frame of reference. So I'd encourage anybody to understand just how powerful it can be again as a coaching tool. We're almost scared of it though as coaches because, you know, if you, if you have a meeting and it's like a classroom, you know, if you hear people giggling and laughing, it should be creativity, energy. Yet we say, all right, listen up, get serious. And then we also do it if you if a team i've done this like if a team walk out and start training and start laughing and giggling when you're ready right all right switch on like yeah they can i don't know how do we change that well one coaching technique that 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 i'd encourage people to think about is build trip wires in so a trip wire says that if you build it in somewhere so so say for example um there's an old pat walsh story where he would paint a white line about 20 yards away from his training pitch. And his rule to the players was that was a tripwire that said, when you cross that first white line, you better be concentrated. You better be focused on what you're going to do. So don't walk on to the field itself talking about a joke that's just taken place or talking about what you plan to do this evening. The first white line is the moment where you stop there and you get your game face on and you focus on what you're about to do. So I'd, I'd encourage coaches to think about that, that humour is powerful in the right place. So when you want people, so in the dressing room, you break it up or something like that, or when there's a down moment, humour's fine, but you have to get them to understand there's a tripwire moment that says, now we switch on, now we focus on it. So you set really clear boundaries around where that has to, where that has to happen. You know, I, I, like I've seen... Lots of coaches develop just from really good tripwires. So um, I made reference before to uh, working with the Scotland guys, Gregor Townsend, the head coach there, is brilliant. So if he's talking about attack to his players, they might be sat in a certain position. When he switches to defence, he stops a meeting and gets everybody to get up and move to a different seat. He gets them to walk out of the room and come back in. 
So he will do different things to say, right, now this is a different message. So you need to break your concentration levels before we get your concentration levels back up again. So he will do that and will deliberately not do anything longer than 15 minutes. And then he will build a tripwire in somewhere into his, into his coaching message to get people to break and then focus again when they come back in. So again, that might just be an idea that any coach is listening. Think about where you can introduce some just some simple trip buyers into your session. I mean, thank you so much. I can't thank you oh, enough loved it. for this time and for your contribution. I can't wait to hear, uh, to read the, the Barcelona book. I'm really, really, really excited about that. That well, comes out in August and I'll send you a copy of it, Gary, I promise. And I'll, I'll, I'll post uh, any information if any of your readers are interested because I'm really proud of it. Thank you, Damien. Thank you for your time. I really appreciate it. Thanks so much to Damien for his time and his insight there. Hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. Um, absolutely brilliant. What I love about that is we talk about building cultures and changing cultures, but I don't think enough time is spent on how to sustain cultures. And once we do build a culture, uh, it's not yet done. Every day that can change, especially in today's sporting landscape with recruitment and the turnover you have either with graduation or players leaving or players coming in so that culture always has to be modified or or improved or sustained and and that's an art in itself and Damien there gives a little bit of insight and in how to work and get those connections with players even more because you know not not even players coming and going but the conditions changing as well with wins losses failure success so understanding that there's coaches I think is very very important um, I'm halfway through his Barcelona book at the minute um, probably get that done next week because I'm flying through it it's, it again it's just Damien's writing is something I would encourage every coach to to order a copy of either the Barcelona book or the Alex Ferguson book or the winning mindsets book his writing is unbelievable it just gets you constantly thinking about what you're doing as a coach and what you're doing with your teams and like I said in the podcast it'll have you laughing as well and, and his, his insights and anecdotes are different class so um, yeah definitely check that out also check him out on Twitter as well Liquid Thinker uh, he is absolutely brilliant insights to, to what you should be doing and what you should be thinking as coaching so thanks so much to Damien again and hope you enjoyed it please before you shoot off give us a little like or a rating on the iTunes page tell me what you think what resonated with you what what was good what was what you didn't agree on anything at all really uh, at Gary Kernin on Twitter at Gary Kernin on Instagram thanks so much for listening and I'll speak to you soon thank you for listening to the modern soccer coach podcast for more coaching topics sessions and resources Head on over to Coach Kernin on Facebook or visit the website at www.modernsoccercoach.com.